Hello. How's everyone doing? Hope you're doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn. Focus, compounding. Sitting next to Jeff Gannon, the number one value investing podcast in the world. Soon to be the number one YouTube value investing channel in the world as well. How's it going today, Jeff? Uh, it's going very well. I like the high energy that you got going on there. Should I pick it up a little bit? Yeah. Should I pick it up a little bit? Yeah, we yeah. hope everyone is having a great day. If you're listening, hit that subscribe button. Thumbs this video up. If you're listening on the podcast side thing, hit that subscribe button as well. Tell your neighbor, tell your parents, tell your friends, tell your kids. Download, create like six different accounts. Hit that subscribe button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Show all the support. We love it. And we want to thank everybody so much uh, for doing that. Also, if you want uh, to get access to our full backlog right now, make sure you download everything because on July 1st, uh, only 20 of the most recent podcasts will be available for free. If you're a regular listener, no worries. It'll be business as usual. Uh, you'll have access to uh, the 20 most recent ones. But of course, if you want to get access to the backlog, uh, there's going to be a link or something that we're going to come up with. And it'll probably only be about eight bucks. Uh, but to get access to that full backlog, we are over like 215 episodes now. Pretty crazy. Hard to believe. And bandwidth isn't cheap. So uh, be on the lookout for that. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about going beyond just good versus bad right. and how to get a, a full view of the actual business, how to get mm -hmm. a 360 degree view of a business. Right. And we always talk about this concept of truly taking the business out of the stock or the stock out of the business mm -hmm. and distinguishing the two. And that's the greatest advantage that an investor can have in the right. public markets is to truly think like a, a business owner. Mm -hmm. And when you're buying a share, you own a fractional share of that business and you have uh, management, you're not a part of management, but you mm -hmm. are an equity holder. And really just being able to fully believe that, fully understand that. And I think what comes with that is really understanding the business at, at its core and judging the business based on things that you know go on, go on within the company. Okay. And what I mean by that is really trying to understand um, you know, what the product is, what the customers, what's mm -hmm. the value proposition? Why do customers right. use this? Why is this better than the competitors? It's really taking the Philip Fisher approach to it, to understanding mm -hmm. the business. Right. So maybe tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that topic and we could kind of go from there. Right. So like going beyond good versus bad, I feel like most people, when they do some sort of research or something, one of their first things is like, they're just going down trying to kind of add up good or bad because they're looking to buy the stock or not. And so they're kind of saying, is this an advantage or disadvantage? So they'll say something like, um, you know, they'll look at competitors and stuff and say, oh, wow, you can do this online easily. Oh, wow, look how much more expensive this company is than competitors, mm -hmm. right? Now, we want to ask, why is that? And are they still successful? I mean, I've actually invested in some companies in which I realized they were a lot more expensive than other competitors and they had bigger market share. And so those two facts were kind of interesting because it meant maybe price isn't the most important thing here. Maybe it means that they have some advantages over others. For some reason, lowering their price wasn't successful in taking market share away from them. So what's the decision making that, you know, these people are, are, are doing in the industry? Yeah. So what do they really care about? And that answer can be anything I've talked before about, like on-time delivery can be really important for some things. Um, customization can be really important. Sometimes the, the all sorts of different things like that could be more important, especially if you're like a lower cost, uh, um, lower of the total um, uh, expenses of you, the, your client. So, uh, you know, let's say that you're providing an important service, but that service is 1% of the cost of um, the business for your, your client, then that often is things that aren't priced matter a lot. Sure. Now, on the other hand, if you're putting up a structure that's mostly steel and you're buying steel, then uh, even all sorts of great service and stuff on that's going to make it very hard for um, you to differentiate in anything other than price. Right, like Berkshire sold suit uh, in men's suit linings and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty meaningful part of the price for the suit maker, and it is um, not something that it's easy for a relationship between that company and some other people to to mean that you're going to have other things besides price. So we wanted things like what kind of what do you compete on? Uh, who's your target market that you have? Right, you can't have everybody. I mean, there are some businesses where you have everybody, you know, um, basically search engines and, you know, yeah. uh, email, free email things and stuff. But of course, if you charge for them, then you couldn't have everybody. But maybe if you did charge, you could get some small percentage of people who are interested in, in something that's different from that. Right. So things like that. Um, and I think the main thing about that is, like I said, getting 
beyond the good bad thing to looking for like what kind of why would someone prefer you over someone else sure with that understanding and why did you organize your business this way versus some other way mm -hmm. and we've talked a lot about this because a lot of times especially in 2020 you're seeing these businesses with freemium models mm -hmm. so what's the difference why do people pay for your product when there is pretty much the exact same product for free right, right? what's the value prop why why is that i mean that's something that could really lead to I guess, sort of this moat that the company could potentially have or their competitive advantage, right? Trying to figure that answer out. Right. And usually it's easier to figure out once you have some understanding of customer behavior already. As an example, let's take Gmail or something, right? So it would have been hard to know that everyone in the world would be okay with their emails being used to generate advertising stuff targeted at them and things um, before that because people will be horrified by that about their mail and stuff. But yeah. they're pretty relaxed about it as long as they get free email stuff. So it, it might not have been easy in the early days of the internet to realize that would happen. But then once you see it and you understand it, you realize that what people want is something they can sign up for immediately and that's free and that's easy that way. But then let's say if it was a thing that's only used for business, would that still be the case? So like, let's say that it was an email thing and stuff like that, but that's only used for business stuff. Would a business be willing to pay a little bit of money to not be an advertiser supported thing for sure. it? Mm -hmm. Like a corporation is a lot different than an individual might use even at home. The very same person, a CEO might be using Gmail at home and might prefer some sort of thing that, you know, has more, um, uh, isn't ad supported because it's not a free uh, version for inside corporate communications or something like that. You mm -hmm. know? So, but what is good and what is bad though? Well, that's the thing that I'm talking about. So people, I think investors try to figure it out as just like a good, bad thing. Sure. Whereas what I'm saying is usually that's not what you find out about a company. We'll use the Tandy example because I've used it many times. Tandy, it was very clear talking to some people that they had some big customers who were very reliant on them and also didn't like certain things about the business. So what is that? Is that a good or a bad? Um, you could look the same way at like Breeze Eastern right? Because that's no longer a publicly traded company. We can talk mm -hmm. about that. They were very dependent on the company. And I think to, we both owned it. Didn't yeah. even know each other. Uh, they're very dependent on the company to um, provide them with replacement parts and things. So that's the good news of it. The bad news of it to some extent is that some people um, maybe didn't know that they had different choices or they didn't have different choices and maybe weren't that satisfied with the company. Not that they were dissatisfied, but for instance, is it good or bad that the company would be very slow to replace things? They didn't keep an inventory. On the one hand, it shows you the tremendous bargaining power that they had, that these people would in some cases like ground their um, uh, a helicopter or something for two weeks waiting for a replacement part instead of having the company keep it in stock like many companies would. But in more competitive industries, you'd have to keep it in stock. Mm -hmm. But in a non-competitive industry, you don't have to keep it in stock. And then it's analyzing what that means. In their case, they're about twice the size of their second biggest competitor. And between the two of them, they had at least three quarters, probably more of the industry. And so there was enough room to support other um, companies in that. And that's why we will look here, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett way. The Warren Buffett way. One thing that's different about Warren Buffett and Phil Fisher, I feel, is that Phil Fisher was an organization guy, very focused on the organization. Are they a good organization? Can they drive growth? All that. Buffett takes a lot more out of the 10K and out of his understanding of microeconomics to understand why a business could be really good, even for reasons that don't have to do with that. Newspapers are a great example of that. He understood that a very low quality newspaper, as long as it's the dominant newspaper in an area, will make at least as much, and historically they've made more, um, than a high quality paper in uh, a worse competitive position or in mm -hmm. the same competitive position. Usually the best uh, money-making papers did were not the best uh didn't have the best journalism or something because a big part of it was the bulletin board aspect of it which you talked about and i think that's an important one because i've talked to people about newspapers and one thing they get kind of confused about newspapers and actually um yeah we can really leave into some other things but about newspapers is that they felt that there was a time before where people were willing to pay for getting news and then that went away and that's never how newspapers worked. Newspapers were ad-supported things locally, in which was very hard in most towns. Take Buffalo, where Buffett invested in the Buffalo Evening News. Um, it was very hard to get a message out to the people of Buffalo other than through the newspaper. Uh, over time, there started to be cable things. There started to be other things. But it was really difficult. And so a huge amount of how they made money newspapers is through the classified ads. And so actually, something like Craigslist or something is as much an explanation of why what happened to newspapers as things that actually are about serving people news. 
news because a newspaper's job was really to take people's eyeballs and put them on some ads that local people wanted, not so much about having people pay every day. Circulation was usually for most papers not enough to make them profitable. Um for news. Mm -hmm. So the idea that like you're in a sense, there was competition on two sides of that business. There's competition for the advertisers and there's competition for the readers. And I think because we're consumers is what happens to us is that we only see the consumer side of it. And we don't understand that. Like we were talking about Spotify or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was saying something that's a little bit different than what some people were saying about like getting podcasts and things. And my point was it's a very expensive business model to buy to rent other people's content on a royalty basis and play it so whether that's netflix with movies that they don't own or spotify with music they don't own that's usually a really bad business model because music publishing is a much better business than broadcasting music that you don't own so you need to get some content from other things that's cheaper Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's kind of like ESPN, right? ESPN can show an NFL game. I'm sure it brings in tons of people to watch it. But what really makes the cash register sing, as Buffett would say, is probably the show where they put on two guys just talking about um, stuff in, uh, on the same channel as that, which brought people in and had people watching because they want to watch those NFL things. But once they get people into watching pure commentary, that costs nothing to produce. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know. And then okay, you have to make a new star every once in a while. You know, mm-hmm. same thing with the news programs. So it's like understanding that sort of thing of what is the real economics behind these things of what's important. And usually there's more than one side to it. And we tend to only see the more consumer facing side, and then we tend to repeat the same stories and things about that. Mm -hmm. And I think the big difference is, so I always say that I think you have a great ability to read a 10K and really take the narrative out of it, right? The story out of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe it does come down to like a microeconomic perspective because there's been so many times where we'll both read the 10K and you're like, I just need to learn more about the actual business itself. So it's like you read the 10K once and then you put it away and then it's really like, okay, let's go see the product. Why do customers use this? You know, what's the value prop, like I said in the beginning and try to understand it from that perspective. I feel like a lot of, investors, they may read the 10K and they're just looking at it from a surface level of the accounting mm-hmm. and everything in there right. as that's opposed the to the issue. actual business itself. And that's right. why I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about doing Scuttlebutt. It's good to go and see this stuff in person because it takes the 10K and just adds a story to it. Like, why are they doing this? You know, what what are they spending money on? Mm. Where does their margin come from? Why are they able to achieve this margin? How could this business scale? And everything like yeah. that, you know, um, and just, you know, doing different sort of research online or in person. But, you know, a lot of what we do is also online. And I think it's knowing how to do good research. Yeah. The thing that concerns me the most with people is like focusing too much to the extent that a dollar of sales, a dollar of gross profit, a dollar of profit is the same in their view. Whereas how they got that is very different. Like in one kind of business, it's very sticky and everything. That kind of profit can be very strong, especially if it's some sort of spread that you're constantly making or something versus making the same money some other way. Like I could talk maybe sometimes about, um, let's see, some businesses I decide not to buy into or something. Mm-hmm. So like there was a business that was a pretty, um, that did, um, that I would have written up for singular diligence based on the numbers and I looked at it. But it was um, doing... Uh, basically like debit card type stuff for uh, college students. Mm. And I felt that the colleges were using them for a certain reason that I think I could understand and stuff and looking into that. But uh, I thought the students hated it. And I thought it was mostly a ripoff of the students and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I didn't know in the long run if students don't like this and they go online and say they don't like this and whatever, they are to a certain extent captive to the, the school. And if the school doesn't care and this helps them in any way, even if it just makes – they don't, it doesn't cost them anything basically and it gets rid of a headache, um, then maybe they'll keep doing it and they have a you know captive market there. Uh, but just because the organizations seem not at all concerned with serving students at all as if they thought of them as their customers, you know? So then I would avoid that kind of thing. The same thing would be true if it was like, you know, when people talk about like, a, um, a, you know, a, any sort of thing where they it's difficult to see. I mean, usually it's an advantage if the customer and stuff is actually benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not always the case, but it, it does help if the customer is getting substantial benefit from it and feels good about the relationship and stuff like that versus cases where that isn't true. Um, I've also talked about Gaines Co. before, and it looks great on the numbers that I've seen, but I do worry about it from the perspective of without getting without getting to know management and stuff, I do feel that I don't understand well enough the business um, model if it's really just mostly about 
um, trying not to pay out claims that might be valid claims and things. And so I looked at reviews online. I looked at things in that. And the picture that the company presents and the picture that other people present is very different. And I don't know how to reconcile that without getting a lot more information about the organization or being some sort of expert in non-standard um, risk, especially for certain kinds of customers. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that enough to compare them to others. You can go online and find things like the complaints that they get versus others. And they stack up well against mm-hmm. that um, for the st- state regulator. And we look at things for state regulators all the time for all sorts of stuff, government sources for all sorts of stuff, and put that together. Mm-hmm. Um, I do read a lot of that kind of stuff. I've mentioned like that I kind of like the lime industry and stuff. And the reason is that I do regularly read like USGS stuff, which gives information about production levels of different things and how many sites they're at and very long-term stuff, which are just government sources on things that can be very useful. Mm-hmm. Well, if, you know, like in this book is great because it really goes into detail. The Warren Buffett way by Robert Heckstrom was, he was talking about, you know, C's candies, for example, why did Buffett mm-hmm. buy C? So on the numbers, you, know, you could take out whatever you want from the numbers, mm-hmm. but Buffett has always talked about these intangible qualities that right. make C such a wonderful business, right? If you go home on Valentine's, he always use an example. Mm-hmm. If you go home on Valentine's Day and you took the low bid on mm-hmm. you know chocolate or whatever, your significant others can be upset. And it, how it has such a, a deep ingrained you know thing in the culture on the West Coast, right now, on the West Coast, you know, yeah. certain parts of the country as well. Or Coca Cola, for example. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of intangible qualities, and you could see it in the numbers that it's interesting. So I think the numbers is always a place where you start, and then from there, it's really trying to trying to build a narrative around that. Why are they able to do this? Why are they right. able to, why do customers use this? Why do they continuously come back, you know, and kind of understand it from the customer standpoint? Yeah. And I think a really big one in that way for Buffett, which is different than Fisher and talking about the microeconomics is you want to spend at least as much time, maybe more on the supply side as on the demand side. Whenever I hear people talk about a stock and like good or bad or something, they say something like, well, demand for lithium will be huge in the next 15 years. Okay, how much supply is coming online? Uh, When we read the... uh, So what does that mean? Okay, that's the danger. And that's why I worry about things like airlines. If people don't understand why sometimes people are more bullish on airlines and I'm more worried about it or that Buffett's more worried about it, it has to do with understanding the supply and the demand. Yeah. I'm worried that the supply couldn't be cut off fast enough, supply growth, in an industry that thought it was going to grow for a while. Meaning too many airplanes. Right. That if there's any demand destruction, um, then you're going to have terrible pricing because of the way pricing works in the industry. The same thing would happen in hotels and stuff, too. I don't think they would be growing as fast. I think there's different ways that you could get supply out of hotels. I think there's all sorts of things like that. But still a problem. So, um, certain, And certainly there's specific places that will have problems with hotels and stuff but my example is sort of like let's say people just have this attitude of like okay will air travel come back or not that's not all that there is to it because it you're not loyal except for frequent flyer miles and things to a specific airline and then the frequent flyer miles cause a problem for them so um it's a very commodity type business uh, there is strong incentive to price the last seat on the plane at a low price. There's a strong incentive for that, actually even stronger incentive in the cruise industry, but the cruise industry, I think, is better at constraining supply. Um, and so because of that, it's like, imagine that 100%, let's say next year, okay, 100% of the demand from uh, um, tourists and stuff goes back, individual travelers, right? But then only 80% of business travel comes back because that could happen. They start using Zoom and things. They don't feel that they need it for everything that way. It's not impossible that you could have only four-fifths come back at the same time that you were otherwise growing the amount of um, uh, preparation that you had for like growth. You thought your industry was growing, say, 5% a year or something. What that does is because of the way the industry works, it's very different than some other industries. It's possible to reposition planes. There's too many of them. They can be very competitive, and so prices can fall. Compare that to Lime. The demand for Lime can drop 40% one year from the next. It barely affects pricing because Lime, cement, things like that. Basically, what are your choices? You have a couple choices nearby you. They're long-term players in the industry. They don't see, they're much better. Their reserves are much better. Lime reserves are much more valuable than oil reserves, for instance, because there's a danger with oil companies. They will keep pumping oil when they shouldn't, whereas the Lime company just won't do that. Mm -hmm. So they won't price that way. So they are smarter about their long-term possibilities in that industry, and that's because there's greater like consolidation and rationalization and the product is too heavy to ship versus its value. I talk about that all the time about like how much easier it is to analyze a business that you can't ship it very far. Um, so I think that the the problem is that people are like, well, how the demand for oil will keep growing or the demand for plane travel will keep growing or whatever. 
okay, it only matters to the extent that in a commodity industry, supply and demand grow at different rates. And so the supply side is really, really important. I'm always more interested in the industries where it seems like, well, maybe they'll be supply constrained in some way. Um, example is, uh, you know, okay, so how much has the demand for air travel grown over time and how in the U.S. and how much has the demand for cigarettes grown? Um, cigarettes have shrunk. Air travel's <laughs> gone up. Guess which stocks have been by far the better business, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Because cigarettes have been a much better business than, than airplanes, mm -hmm. than airlines. Buffett actually talked about in the Berkshire meeting how many pounds of chocolate they had just sitting mm -hmm. there right and like, yeah. what are you going to do with that I, of course because he was talking about easter chocolate and stuff that's wasted away sure and that's even true like we said for fashion things and stuff like that that's gone for movies i mean that's a some movie theaters were lucky that a movie uh, studios were lucky that way but movies are also a perishable thing because they have this big push to i mean like if it's a netflix movie they just dump it on netflix and hope that people will watch it mm -hmm. but if it's a movie that goes through theaters the initial run is the added uh, campaign. So they have an ad campaign. They run trailers. They put things in the theaters and stuff. But actually, they may just be hoping to break even in theaters initially, and then they'll make all their profit in the aftermarkets and stuff. But you won't remember there was a big movie unless um, unless it went out in, in theaters and stuff. And so in cases of movies like Onward and Trolls and stuff, those movies will be watched by a bunch of people. But I don't know if they'll ever be remembered as well as they would have been if not. And so they may not sell as much in the long run, like, you know, years from now on demand in places, they may not get the airtime that they would in, in, um, you know, all around the world at, on different TV networks and things, because that's such a crucial part of the business. So it's, it's really tough for them. And it was lucky for the companies, the movies that decided to move it. I mean, an example is like the James Bond thing. If they hadn't decided to move that Jeff's favorite movies. Uh, yeah. My favorite movie franchise. <laughs> if they hadn't decided to move that as early as they did, that would be a huge problem because they try to launch that like all around the world with a great deal of fanfare and it would be hugely harmful to the industry. Now it's a franchise that eventually people would watch it and whatever it, it, it you know, same thing as if, they did a Star Wars thing or whatever, it would become part of the canon and people would watch it of whatever. But it's significantly less valuable if it was launched when it was supposed to be during COVID than if it's moved to the uh, fall or something. And even now, if there's further outbreaks and stuff, with enough warning, they can do different things of ways of distributing and whatever. But if you were unlucky to be one of the movies that was launched in the first few weeks of a shutdown, that was devastating to you because you'll never get back that that juice that you had in terms of the buzz in the public from it. You can never create that that word of mouth again and stuff that was all built up for launching it. That's what they do. So you got to read the book that will never work. Uh, that will never work about Netflix. Okay, and he gives a point in there. He says if your first launch fails, just relaunch. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's kind of with same with movies as well. Well, we talked about that with um uh. What's the book? Uh, Quench your own thirst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, yeah, same they, thing. Basically, <laughs> angry. Yeah, they 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 had Rogers like twice. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've done two things. They did uh, they did a tea thing and an angry orchard thing that with somewhat different stuff was successful and then um, was not successful and they were just launching it. But that's the thing where they believe that demand for it exists and then like it didn't work out and so they they keep doing it but they're believed in it. Um, yeah, that has happened quite a few times. It's like if you see a local restaurant, they have a sign on there, grand opening. And, you know, four months later, they still have like the same sign of grand opening. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's kind of funny. So then what should the investor focus on then? I think understanding the business and its uniqueness. So understanding a few things. One, understand the industry. I've said before, I think half of the value of the stock really is understanding the industry. Mm -hmm. You should spend half the, your time on the industry. And then understanding the positioning of the company in the industry. IKEA and Nebraska Furniture Mart. Our furniture stores, they're not selling the same thing exactly. And their model is different from everybody else's model, and they're each unique. So you want to study that as opposed to the others in the, in the um, industry, like where do they fit in and stuff. When we talked about freemium and and like premium type stuff, usually there's someone who's very focused on the premium side of things and someone who's focused, very focused on the free things. Sometimes there's someone who's focused on signing up with millions of individual users and someone who only wants to serve tens of thousands of corporate users. Those are very different things. Uh, a lot of times I ask things about sales things, what's the sales cycle is a very common question I ask for things like, um, like uh, for instance, with banks and things like that. Um, for commercial industrial lending and stuff, it's often a very long sales cycle. And they'll say that, that from the first time that someone in their organization had contact with someone in an organization that eventually became a major depositor and borrower can be several years. Sometimes it's three, four, five years that they knew someone there before they actually had a big relationship there. Um, ad agency things, sometimes they get pretty small uh, clients that grow over time and stuff. 
stuff and they get more and more of their business over time. So the day one thing is usually not a critically different thing that they got one little business win. But over time, it matters a lot. But it depends on having constantly people being aware you're there and mm-hmm. your possibility. And then eventually you get a moment that you can pitch something, you know. Cool. Well, I thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube and on the podcast side of things. If you want to use the service that Jeff and I use, the website, quickfs.net, and you sign up to get historical financial information, pull the financial models of companies, uh, make sure you tell them that you came from Focus Compounding. Uh, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Mr. Jeff and myself today, and we will see you in the next podcast.